human brain is special, right? It really makes us who we are. So it's very difficult for people to agree on what consciousness is. People feel there's something special about brain tissue. That if you make a brain organoid, for example, from cells from them, that that brain organoid will carry their thoughts and feelings, you know. And whether or not the science supports that doesn't matter. These organoids are small tissues that mimic parts of the brain. We're not regrowing our brain all the time like we are our intestines. So for the brain, we have to actually go back to development, help them to start making the early cells of the brain and try to model the way the brain develops. We just can't really capture all of the complexity that the human brain has. And so this suddenly opens a, a window into that black box. I started working with mouse embryonic brain, taking cells, dissociating them, and then plating them in a dish, in a, you know, a petri dish to let them grow. And what happened was some of these cells just didn't really stick to the dish and they sort of came off and started, you know, attaching to each other instead and forming these beautiful, you know, self-organizing balls of cells that just sort of form, you know, these structures that look like the developing, at least the early stages of developing brain tissue. And so that was really what kicked it all off. And then from there, um, Jürgen and I decided that it would be worthwhile looking at whether we can do this from human cells and help them to start making the early cells of the brain. And just like those mouse embryonic cells, human cells can also you know, self-organize and form these beautiful three-dimensional structures. The human brain is kind of special, right? It really makes us who we are. It really makes us human, it makes us individuals. We don't have a lot of cells in the adult brain. You know, we're not like regrowing our brain all the time like we are our intestine. And so for the brain, we have to actually go back to development and try to model the way the brain develops. These Organoids are sort of small um, tissues that mimic parts of the brain. The, the human brain has lots of parts. And so uh, when we make an organoid, we might be making an organoid of one part or maybe a couple different parts. And also it's important to emphasize that they're very small and they're also immature. They're not, you know, these are not models of like a fully functioning, fully formed human brain with all of its memories and, you know, and abilities. Um, and so depending on what you're making, you might make um, a brain organoid for, you know, the cerebral cortex, or you might make one for, you know, the cerebellum. We'll, um, you know, take these tissues and we'll just look inside and look at how, you know, how neurons are being made, how they're maturing, how other supportive cell types of the brain are being made and how they interact with neurons. Well, I think we've started to really gain some insight into what actually does make the human brain unique and starting to understand why it is that we have so many more neurons than, you know, even our closest relatives like chimpanzees and gorillas. And it's starting to reveal that there are some really important differences in timing um, in human brain development. And basically what really makes us unique, it seems, is we're very slow. So we develop very slow much more slowly than chimpanzee or gorilla. And because it's slower, the cells have a longer time to expand and generate more. And so that we think is why we end up with so many more neurons. The timing difference between human and chimpanzee, it's not very much. It's only a few days, but it's at a really key moment. And, and so because of this small change very, very early, it has lasting consequences that get magnified over time. One of the very first things we did with brain organoids was to model a disease because that is exactly what we need these for. Um, and so the disease that we decided to focus on is called microcephaly. It's a disorder where the brain is too small. If you introduce the exact same mutation uh, that you find in humans into a mouse, you end up with basically no effects on brain size. So it's clear that human, the human brain is much more sensitive and you get a dr much more drastic reduction in size than in humans. So we decided to model that in organoids and see if we could see that, that reduction. And in fact, uh, we could. So basically what ends up happening in that case is you have these stem cells and they start making neurons too soon. And so because they make 
neurons too soon, they don't spend a long time expanding and they run out. And then you just run out of stem cells too soon and then you don't have any more to make more neurons. I'm especially excited about some of the disease modeling in terms of like, you know, things like mental health disorders or neurodegenerative diseases where, um, again, we just don't have new treatments, you know? I mean, schizophrenia, we're still treating with drugs that are like, you know, 50 years old. And, uh, and I, it's, just, it's just how do you model that in a mouse, right? You know, it, we just don't have good models. So I think these models can finally start to, to hopefully give us some new inroads. But interestingly, you know, I mean, we're starting to um, get some ideas about some of the genetic differences between human and chimpanzee that might be sort of guiding these differences in cellular behaviors we see. And uh, the genes that are kind of popping out are also genes that are involved in human disorders, which makes sense because, of course, if, if something is really important for human brain development and evolution, then if it's mutated, it's probably going to cause a brain disorder. And so actually a lot, of the, a lot of the very basic fundamental biology that we're doing in my lab I think probably has some important implications for um, you know, disease modeling and, and treatment hopefully in the future. Maybe in the even longer term, the organoids themselves could actually be a therapy. Maybe not for all brain regions because obviously we can't really go and start replacing our frontal lobes or our hippocampus, you know, the parts of the brain that really like store our memories and make us who we are. But, you know, thinking about things like um, dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, you know, which is lost in patients with Parkinson's disease, we could make substantia nigral organoids and then transplant them potentially. So they could themselves be, be a therapy. So organoids have been transplanted into animals, not so much for the purpose of, um, you know, using the organoids as a therapy, but more for the purpose of um, sort of using the animal as a way to further improve the organoids because the organoids lack vasculature and they lack other cell types that come from outside the brain, most notably the microglia, which are sort of the immune cells of the brain. To start to look at how those other cells kind of interact uh, with human brain tissue, other groups have started transplanting organoids into mouse or rat. It's, a, it's also another way to test potential therapies because ultimately if you're going to give a therapy to a person for a brain disorder you're giving it to the person as a whole so your targets the brain but they're going to get it in their whole body so a transplantation model like that allows you to look at how your therapeutic is going to influence not only the human brain tissue but also the organism as a whole I think we're pretty far away from enhancing animal cognition with organoids. I think it's for a long time probably still going to damage animal cognition. Organoids are not organized like an actual brain. If you put human brain organoids into, for example, a mouse brain, you start to see those cells connecting up with the mouse neurons and receiving input and sending output. At the moment though, it's very rudimentary sort of activity. And I think that is because they are just not organized. They don't, we know that a lot of what allows for our higher order thinking has to do with how the different parts of the brain are connected, how individual neurons connect up with each other, and then how groups of neurons connect with other groups, and then how whole brain regions connect with other brain regions. It's really about that, that whole structure. And right now, the organoids are sort of like, you know, a little piece of a cortex, for example, and then sort of like put into another context that they don't normally experience, you know, they wouldn't normally be in. And so, in, in some ways, it's almost like implanting a tumor, you know. It's, it's an abnormal structure that is not really functioning in, a, in, a, in the proper sort of, you know, like hierarchical way that the brain functions. And so, um, in actuality, a lot of times those mouse models, after they've had the transplantation, they actually perform worse in lots of cognitive sort of measurements and things. And it's because basically you've just put a, it's almost like you've short-circuited their brain. And so it's very artificial and it's, it's very unorganized. So if 
if it's possible to generate something that is truly organized in that fashion, maybe, but you still then run into other issues like human organoids follow human timing. And a mouse only lives about two years. But we know it takes longer than two years for humans to become very intelligent beings. Um, and the other thing is size. Hu hu the human brain is so amazing because it's so big. That's a big part of why we're so intelligent. There's no way you can fit a human-sized brain into a mouse. <laughs> so I, I think for a lot of those kinds of questions, I think we probably don't need to worry about that in the near future. They don't have vasculature, they're not the right size, they're not organized, and they're not mature enough, and they don't have input and output. All of those things you would need to have in order to have a functioning brain. Vasculature is so much more complex. Um, that, I think that problem of trying to vascularize and get truly functional vascularization with blood flowing and perfusing through the tissue and really going in a directional manner as well, bringing in nutrients, taking away um, you know, byproducts, that is going to be much more difficult actually um, because it's just the way vasculature develops in the body is incredibly complex. Um, people have started to uh, make headway with at least um, introducing vascular cells, but again, getting like real functional perfusion of blood. You know, you have to figure out what are you going to perfuse it with? We need a blood substitute. How are you going to pump it through? We basically then need a heart. Um, and then, you know, all the different cell types, you need not just endothelial cells, but you need, you know, a hundred different cell types. And so it's, uh, it's, there's a lot of more hurdles I think we would have to overcome. So I think we're still pretty far away from that. I, th I think it's decades. Really, if you want to vascularize an organoid, it needs a body. <laughs> and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to generate a whole body in a, in, a, in a dish, I think, anytime soon. <laughs> Even if you had a fully formed vascularized large human brain developing in a dish, if it had no input or output, it has nothing to think about. For example, if you, if you take an animal during development and you close the eyes so that it can't see, later you open the eyes, the eyes are still working fine, but the brain cannot receive or interpret uh, visual input because it hasn't received it during development. We took human organoids and we observed neurons sending out processes just like in the actual brain you have these processes that come from the brain and go into the spinal cord and in the organoids we could see these cells sending out processes just like that almost you know directing towards a spinal cord target but they didn't have one so we gave them basically we put a piece of spinal cord there and we were able to show that they could innervate and even trigger muscle contractions if there was muscle nearby so that's output there was no sensory input but yeah, you can definitely start to get that kind of thing. You know, there are these ethical questions that surround organoids. And so we need to have a good reason to be doing things with these tissues. Um, different people have different viewpoints about um, things like consciousness or, you know, where our thoughts and feelings really come from. And no matter what the science says, people feel there's something special about brain tissue. And so, and so there are some people who feel that if you make a brain organoid, for example, from cells from them, that that brain organoid will carry their thoughts and feelings, you know. And whether or not the science supports that doesn't matter. We need to respect that. And I think that then using those for purposes that are not clearly beneficial, you know, to humanity and to patients and to the people that those cells come from, um, I, I just don't see really the, the, the justification for, you know, using them for trying to make a super powerful computer. It's very difficult for people to agree on what consciousness is. I would say that you really do need to have at some point in your development a body to be able to have some kind of cognitive and, you know, consciousness. You know, there are patients, for example, who experience locked-in syndrome, where they lose sensory input and they have no ability for output, and their brain is basically 
cut off from the world outside and it's a horrific experience, you know. But those are people who previously had a body. So they developed with a body, they developed all of the memories and connections with loved ones. If a brain never had the body, it has no ability to experience locked-in syndrome because it never developed those connections in the first place. If the brain has never had any experiences with anything, then it has nothing to think about. I think as a community, we really need to come together and come up with guidelines. I've been involved with the International Society for Stem Cell Research, who has um, put together guidelines and standards for these sorts of in vitro models, including uh, brain organoids. And, um, and I think that's a really good starting point, you know, come up with uh, sort of criteria that um, we agree are, um, you know, potentially sort of go, no-go points. So a mouse can satisfy many of those criteria, obviously. It's got a pretty big brain, it's organized, it can mature, all of that, but we don't believe that it has the same level of consciousness as human. And so what's different? Well, a big part of it is size. So if we go and say, well, if we're gonna make, we can make human organoids that are totally hooked up, but as long as they're small, we feel that they're probably not gonna have human level consciousness. You know, so I think these kinds of criteria are probably a, a, a much more practical way forward, rather than trying to spend a lot of time trying to measure consciousness in organoids. And I'm not sure we'll ever actually get to some agreement on that. Because I don't even know if you're conscious, you know. All I know is I am. <laughs> what bothers me the most, I have to say, is the way that these organoids are sometimes described in, not only in, uh, in the press, but also just sometimes by scientists themselves, who can um, sometimes overblow the potential of these and start using words like conscious, you know, and um, sentience and things like that. And I just think that that's really damaging to the field and it's also just scares people unnecessarily. I think that that's a, a, actually the most unethical behavior being done right now, is not the actual work being done on organoids, but the way some people are talking about the organoids.